Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning. I don't know if you had the same experience as I did, but when you come to Christ, you have a real desire for the Word of God. Uh, it's interesting how that works. When you have the Spirit in you, uh, you want the Word. And um, back in 1999, I had that experience, uh, trusted in Jesus Christ. And, and at the time, uh, my wife and I were uh, living in Coeur d'Alene, and we... Uh, Decided, I decided I wanted to go to some church that teaches the word. And I didn't know what I was talking about. I'd never even set a uh, foot in a church like this. Didn't even know what happened in, in rooms like this. And uh, so anyway, we started trying churches all over the place. Went to this one church that put a little Christmas sticker on you. And if, if anybody saw the Christmas sticker, then you automatically got a hug. And so we were out of there. And uh, we went to some of... Eventually, we tried like every church until we, one day I said, hey, why don't I just try the church across the street? Literally across the street was Coeur d'Alene Bible Church. Went over to Coeur d'Alene Bible Church. It was, it was beautiful. It, the, the, the worship, the, uh, the word teaching um, really blessed my heart. And one of the things that I noticed was that they were really a missions-focused church. And so instantly, I wanted to become a missionary. And... Uh, they always talked about their missionaries. And one of the missionaries that kept coming up was this guy named Rob Cheely. He was a missionary that worked in China. This is back, this is in 1999, 2000 is when I was started hearing about this famous missionary that worked in China. And so next thing you know, I'm wandering off. Uh, in 2004, we wandered off to Hayden Bible Church. Kind of never had met Rob. Uh, uh, one day... Somewhere in the 2012-ish vicinity, I think, 2013 vicinity, uh, Steve had asked Rob to come and speak at one of our men's breakfasts in the old building. Who, who remembers the old building? Yeah, well, the old building is like the size of the kitchen. Uh, anyway, so Rob came and spoke at the old building during a men's breakfast, and I just really was blessed by what he taught, and he... I kept asking questions and questions during the time that he allowed us to ask questions. And eventually, afterwards, he came up and said, hey, why don't we have coffee together? And that began a friendship. Um, I'm privileged to call Rob my friend. He's a, a guy that uh, invests in young men uh, for their spiritual growth, in, certainly in leadership. And Rob is, uh, the, I think, the founder of Blessed China International a ministry that um, obviously is works in in China, um, but then he's also a trained physician. The Lord called him out of a normal practice into serving him overseas, and um, and so Rob had, uh, he he kind of walked away from that physician life that he could have here, went overseas and started serving the Lord in bringing not only the blessing of help in health care and other realms, but the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ into small villages all over the place. And Rob um, also uh, just happens to, uh, like he's done with me, and in, in many hours I've gotten the privilege of spending with Rob, he's, he invests in people in China to become leaders. He invests in people in Brazil. Uh, I don't remember the country in Africa, but in Africa. Um, he's a servant of the Lord in developing leaders in the church. And so then uh, that helps build those ministries in those different places. And so um, Rob and his wife, Noelani, uh, have served in China, uh, I think live, I think for a short period of time more in Hawaii. Uh, Noelani is a, a native Hawaiian. And then I think soon going to be moving here uh, and having this be the base, and then back still to serve in all those areas. One of the things I know about Rob is that when you spend time with him at a coffee shop, you leave sore. It's like you're doing squats the whole time, or push-ups, because he'll work you over and challenge you. And so I hope that he does that today. So Rob, why don't you come on up? And don't forget to turn on the light. Good morning. Um, while we were singing, I, I uh, had a thought. I enjoyed that first song quite a bit 
but uh, one, one of the nicest times I've ever had in worship was I got asked to teach a six-day seminar to 600 African pastors. And uh, it was uh, an amazing time. We, we taught six hours a day, six days, and each night we'd all go down to, we rented a, a field and had to rent this great big uh, uh, bunch of speakers and a stage, and, and I'd preach for two or three hours and then ask people to come to Christ. And, and uh, they, they, the guy that ran the whole thing claims that 2,000 people came to Christ because those 600 pastors that people would, would sign up and those 600 pastors would take their name and address and go out to their homes uh, after that week of, of teaching. But it was the, the thing that I enjoyed the most about the week is, is we'd have like a one to two hour praise session every morning. And uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a black church in the South or in Chicago or New York. If you ever are out somewhere and you don't know what church to go to and you want to have a really great time worshiping God, find a, you know, ask around which, which black church has the best worship time. Because I'll tell you what, they, they know how to church, uh, how, to, how to do worship. But uh, in Africa, it's like twice what they, they do in the, the big cities in America. And uh, to worship God with, with 600 African pastors, uh, just uh, they, they love to sing and worship God. And it, it's just a privilege to get to travel around the world and do things like that. But that, that probably ranks in the top five things I've ever done in my life is worshiping with those guys. I still. Actually, uh, we go back there, and, and uh, so I got a bunch of pastors from China to pay for seminary. None of these 600 guys had ever been to seminary. And uh, a bunch of pastors in China were asking you know, what they could do for overseas missions, and I said, well, this guy needs to go to a good seminary. And there, there's actually one, this was in Uganda, and he lives up in a place called Masindi, which is about a four hour drive north of Kampala, and there's a good Bible school in Kampala. So we actually sent him to three years of, of seminary, and, and now he's the leader of these 600 pastors down there. It's, a, it's just a wonderful thing to see what God does when, when uh, the Holy Spirit moves people around the world to, to join him in growing people. I'd, I'd like us to just take a minute right now and... Uh, the reality is, as I'm going to talk about a little bit this morning, that, uh, that none of us has anything to learn or grow in or think about unless the Holy Spirit comes and personally delivers some message into your heart, into your mind, and, and, uh, and brings to you the desire and the faith and the love for God and the humility that it takes to grow. You know, you don't grow from people talking or from reading books. You grow when the Holy Spirit takes those things and puts them into your inner person and, and you know, pokes at what's, what's in there and says, let's, let's see you become more like Christ. And then he does that. And he's the only one capable of that. You can't get that from a person or a book or, or a church they can certainly be his tools for bringing those words to you. But, but let's just stop right now and, and have each of us uh, ask God the Holy Spirit to, to bring something to your inner person today that uh, he will use to grow you more into the likeness of Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we, we bow humbly and, and uh, thank you for the fellowship of your spirit, for the eternity that we will spend in your presence, for your many outpourings of grace into our lives, the grace of faith and of love for you and of a humbling that you do within us by your revelations of 
who you are and who we are. And I ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us this morning in great and mighty ways that we have not known. And we thank you that you are a God who certainly accomplishes this. We proclaim you to be our Lord and our only hope, and we pray in your name. Amen. Um, I don't know if, if some of you don't have one of these, but um, maybe I could hand them to Keegan, who's a great friend, and he can bring you one if you don't have one. Um, I used to have a, uh, a friend uh, who was a, a teacher in a, a Bible school, and, and he used to often say uh, at, the, at the beginning of his message, uh, what in the world is God doing? And, uh, you know, it's a great question to, to, to think about because uh, we are the, the primary means of what God is doing in the world, and he's chosen that we be at, at the center of what he does in the world. But I want to throw out an idea into your thinking uh, because it, it really helps to think of God in this way. Um, so what, what God is mostly doing in the world is that he reveals himself to us and to non-believers. He, he shows us, that, that's how he draws us into himself. You know, he doesn't give out little packets of faith. He reveals faithfulness. So we, we see this picture of a faithful God. We, we see a a picture of a loving God. We, we find out because he shows it to us that he's gracious. So he just, he reveals and reveals and reveals. A lot of it is, is through his word he reveals. But um, that's most of what he's doing. And if you think about your own life, you know, you, you came to Christ if you are in Christ. Uh, he, you came into Christ by this series of revelations that came from God the Holy Spirit into your inner person. And he showed you from the word or from preaching or from someone's life, uh, he showed you who he was. And he, he showed you gentleness and tenderness and mercy and forgiveness and healing and power and light and holiness. And it, you, you see those things and he he grows and grows and grows that revelation of how he's showing you who and what he is, and it, it produces faith. The faith is his work entirely. He comes, and as he reveals, you trust him because you see this, this God is trustworthy, and you love him because you see this is someone who is probably the only uh, person or, or entity that I know who's worthy of love. And he humbles you because he shows you himself and compares you to yourself. And you see those two things at the same time and you, it, it humbles your heart. You know, he doesn't come and toss in packets of humility to get you to be humble. He just shows you who you are and you realize I'm weak, I, I'm sinful. I, I don't obey God. And you see him and you say, wow, he's gracious and holy and all those things I just got done saying. And so he's, he's a revealer of himself. That's his primary task. And it's the main way that he drew us into that place where as he established faith by his revelations, we, we just had faith. We trusted because he completed a work in us of establishing faith. We loved him because he showed us his loveliness. We, we were humble in his presence because he clearly showed us, in contrast to everything about him, who we are. And, and so God reveals and reveals and reveals. And, and we then become his primary um, manner of revelation in the world after his word, although most people are going to get exposed to us before they get exposed to his word. 
And, and so um, we are this instrument of revelation. I, I, I've told a story out here, which I won't go through again because it takes 20 minutes to tell it. And, and Steve asked me not to go more than 90 minutes this morning. So, so we got to keep it down. Um, but um, I've told you a story about an old woman who was illiterate, and, and one day she was asking me about the temple of God. She had just come to Christ, and, and I, I showed her in First and Second Corinthians, you know, you, we, you, are the temple of the living God. And, and she, it was like the Holy Spirit took that thought and just drove it into her as the foundation of Christianity. You know, I am a temple of the living God. And uh, that's uh, part of what I want to talk about today, that um, not that we are temples of the living God. I actually talked about that as the topic of, of a message here a while back. Um, but that that is sort of the, the essence of our identity, who we have become as a result of God's work to bring us to be in Christ. And uh, we've become the place on the earth. Another time, I think I spoke here about how the temple of God is in history from the tabernacle to the first temple to the second temple to the physical body of Jesus Christ to the present body of Jesus Christ. This is the place on earth from which God accomplishes that primary purpose of revealing himself. So he's got a place where his glory dwells on the earth. And it started among his people in the tabernacle out in the desert. And then uh, you, you can go read about it. And they dedicated the temple and the glory of God came down I mean the tabernacle, and the glory of God came down into the tabernacle. And then you can go read, same thing happened in the temple that Solomon built. And then the same thing happened in Nehemiah's temple. And then uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, the same thing happened. The glory of God was shown to be, uh, he didn't at that time bring the glory of God into Christ, but it was revealed to his disciples. There's the glory of God inside of our friend Jesus. And <clears throat> then at, at Pentecost, he brought the glory of God to dwell in the new body of Jesus, the church, us. And that has been, since that day, the dwelling place of the glory of God on the earth. He's continued this succession of having a central place in the world from which he reveals himself primarily out into the world. And that's who we are. We are individually the, the temples of the living God, and we are corporately the one temple of the living God, all in whom the spirit of glory, as the Bible calls him, all in whom the spirit of glory dwells are the, the composition of, they are members of the temple of God. And, and so that's who we are, and that makes us his point of primary revelation out into the world. And, and so often um, we think of these things as ideas, and, and they are, and uh, we, th we often think of it only as uh, theological things that we affirm and that God tells us, and, but it, it, it often kind of remain, remains a, a fog in our mind uh, as to what that really means for me. What does it mean for me that I'm a, a temple of God? I'm a, I'm a point of his revealing his glory among the nations. And I, and I want to talk a little bit today ab about that reality of identity and how much it plays a role in whether or not we fully participate with God in his attempt to use us as that point of revelation of his glory out into the world. Because he, 
you know, he, he purchased us for a purpose, and the purpose was this revelation. There, there really isn't any other purpose uh, beyond uh, here on the earth, but his, his other purpose is that we might enjoy fellowship with him. That's the even more foundational purpose, that we might enjoy God, that we might live in his presence for eternity. But he extends that invitation to our time here right now, that we might abide in him, that we might live in his presence, that we might learn what it means to walk by his spirit, to be controlled by his spirit, to, to find the love that he puts inside us for him to be the controlling factor of life day by day by day. And I want to talk about uh, one little part of how he does that. You know, how does God bring about this transforming process where we become not just theologically, but in practice, his place of revelation of his glory to the world? Because that's what he bought us for. It's the only purpose of a Christian beyond their purpose with God of just being in fellowship with him. But the interesting thing between those two ideas, those two purposes, fellowship with God and being used as his revelation, is that the one empowers the other. That, that fellowship, that daily going into his presence and presenting ourselves to him, which uh, Paul described as worship. So worship is that fellowship with him that allows him to control us, to be the one who determines decisions and who reveals his will, who brings the power and the love and the humility that it takes to submit to him being able to do that within us and through us. And so I want to, this is the kind of thing we talk about with, with people that, that are wanting to grow in Christ. And I, I'd be surprised if that isn't most of you, uh, your present condition. And that's what happens when, when God starts revealing. We want more of all of this goodness that he is and that he has and that he brings to us through that fellowship that we have with him. So I want to uh, talk a little bit about how specifically that happens and, and how we can uh, pursue the work of God, the Holy Spirit, to do more of this transforming of us that is his hope. You know, he's waiting, and that's what he's waiting for, that fellowship, that worshiping life, that abiding in his presence that just allows him to take all we are and transform it, mold it, until it is uh, easily uh, a tool, a vessel for him to reveal himself to the world. And so that's what he's waiting on. A lot of us often think that we're waiting on God. And, and of course, there is a, a waiting on God that uh, needs to be a part of this whole process, a, a learning to, to go be in his presence and, and plead with him and worship him and praise him and, and say to him, please come. I, I've got nothing good to, to offer this world. I've got no power, no hope, no holiness until you come and bring your power, your holiness, your goodness, your life. There's my hope. And it's, it's already inside of every true believer. Our spirit is in union with his spirit. And so that, that goodness of God is sitting inside of us already if we are in Christ and waiting for us to say, okay, I'll submit my will and you can have my, my time and my life and all that you uh, have given me and all of my sin along with all of that and you can displace anything that is not of Christ and, and fill me up with your spirit of life and bring light out into the world. As, as you study uh, the Bible, there's a lot of wonderful 
teaching in there that uh, specifically describes this union that we have and this, this thing that God has done to establish us as his temple. And there's, there's a great book that, that uh, is kind of interesting um, written by a guy named Henry Skugel about 350 years ago. He was just a young guy. I think he was something like 27 years old when he wrote the book, died a couple years later. And uh, it, it became kind of a common book for people wanting to grow in their uh, relations with God uh, for them to read. And the, the mother of John and Charles Wesley uh, read that book while her two sons were over in uh, the United States, or which wasn't the United States yet, but um, they were missionaries down in the southeastern, I, th I think it was in Georgia, but I don't really remember. But um, they were working there, and she was reading this book. But uh, George Whitfield had uh, been a very close friend of her two sons when they were at Oxford and had created together this little club called the Holy Club. And the truth is, um, none of them really understood God that well, maybe even to the point of, of not really being in Christ yet. It isn't clear. But um, S Susanna gave this book to George Whitfield and told him how much it had meant to her. And he read it and, and says that the, the whole understanding of his identity in Christ just suddenly became clear from reading the book because it, it, it just takes several scriptures and puts them together into a picture of, you know, I am a temple of the living God. I have a purpose on earth and it's his purpose and he means to reveal himself into the world through me and the goodness that is necessary, the holiness, the wisdom to accomplish that uh, is, is all put in there in his union that he has established between my spirit and his. And there's, there's a great passage uh, that talks about this in 2 Corinthians, and it, it starts towards the end of chapter 2 in 2 Corinthians, and it, it describes this uh, reality, uh, it starts in verse 14, and, but it describes this reality of what God is trying to do. And it, it, it says that, that uh, we, we become a, frag a fragrance of Christ to the dying and to the living from God. And uh, that's who we have become. And then he says, who is adequate? To, to be that? How, how is it that we can be this, this, this thing from God going out into the world to, to bring this beautiful aroma of Christ into the world around us? Who's adequate for that? And then a, a, a couple verses later, he answers the question. Um, God is our adequacy. God himself provides the adequacy of who we are, but it's it's a wonderful passage. But it, it leads off, it leads on into an even more wonderful passage that has been used as one of the primary descriptions of what a Christian is uh, over the last many many centuries, and it, it's that we are the light of the glory of God in an earthen vessel. So. You know, the earthen part of that means, you know, we're part of this world. We're, we're rotting. We're decaying. We're, we're going on into uh, dying and death here in our physical uh, presence. But the reality is that the eternal spiritual being that has been established inside of us is not going to decay and, and day by day it is becoming more and more and more a representation of Christ, an aroma of Christ. And he says in the passage, you are the letter that God has helped us to write by his spirit to the world about 
who Christ is. It's a, it's a wonderful passage. It's, it's two, more than two chapters long. Go, go and start at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, about verse 12, and, and read on for the next two chapters and, and think about this idea of how God is describing every believer, every, every soul that is in Christ as this vessel in which he has put the light of his glory for a purpose, to reveal the light of his glory out into the world. You know, and who is adequate for such things? Well, God is our adequacy. And so the, the question isn't, um, well, you know, how, how can that be a real uh, reality from me. I, I'm weak. I, I have flesh that's weak. And uh, even though, you know, sin shall not, no longer be master over me, and even though I have the divine nature from Christ, uh, I'm, I'm very weak, very, very weak, weak beyond any ability to actually live out goodness, live out holiness, except for one thing. The, the control of the indwelling Christ, the, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of light, the spirit of life, the spirit of glory, and on and on and on, who he has placed in communion with our spirit. So there's, there is our adequacy. We, we really do have no good thing, not, not even a little sliver of something good, separate from that spirit of holiness. So there is God as our adequacy, the light in the vessel, the life of Christ, you know, the, the, the life of God in the soul of man. That, that was the title of this little book that Susanna gave to George Whitfield. And yes, the name of the book? The Life of God in the Soul of Man, Henry Skugel, S-C-O-U-G-A-L. Um, but uh, then uh, Whitfield uh, was waiting for his two friends to come back from being missionaries because he realized they probably didn't really understand biblical Christianity yet. And he was so excited to give them both the book. And he actually met uh, both of them at the dock when they returned from the Americas. And, uh, and they, he, he said, you've got to read this book that your mom gave me, and it's just changed my life, and I think it'll change yours. And it did. And, and they found the reality of what it means to be in Christ, and uh, that, that God had put his life. I, it's not clear, you know, when they became Christians. It doesn't really matter. But um, they certainly didn't understand uh, biblical Christianity prior to having Schugel explain it to them in the book. And, and it's, a, <clears throat> it's a wonderful thing to know these truths. But I, I would guess that if I read off a hundred different points from Scripture that are different little parts of this truth of the life of God in the soul, uh, in your soul, and asked you if you believe the truth of that verse, that probably 100% of every one of you already believe all of these truths that I could read to you right out of the Bible. You've been taught them. You've, you've had good teaching year after year after year. And you believe these truths. And so there's something else beyond just knowledge and assenting to truth that has to happen, that God has to do within us that leads us to that place where he can actually control us uh, day by day by day by his spirit of holiness within so that we walk in the spirit. That's what walking in the spirit is. We worship, he controls. We present to him all that we are and all that we have, and he comes and, 
and forms wisdom and empowers our will and empowers our gifts and brings love and on and on. All of the things that I don't have that are good by the presence of Christ within me, he empowers them so that they become how we walk through a day. And Paul calls it walking in the Spirit. You know, Galatians 5, 16 and 25, Romans 8, 4, three descriptions or statements of walking in the Spirit. You know, one of the, I'm going to give you a little assignment a little bit later, and it's not this assignment. We have another assignment that's called learning to walk in the Spirit. You know, what does it look like? Jesus did it. What did it look like for Jesus to do it? Uh, the Bible describes it. What does it look like in the biblical description? But more importantly, how do we submit to this spirit of life, this spirit of power? How do we actually interact with him in such a way that his power, his life, is welcomed moment by moment by moment to control, to bring wisdom to, to form a will that submits to the will of God as Christ did in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, not my will, but thine, because he has put so much love and humility and faith into us that we want what he wants, as Christ always did. But uh, I, I uh, had a friend who I met uh, up at a missions conference in uh, Three Hills, Alberta at Prairie Bible. Um, and I was sitting listening to the speaker and, and uh, I could see his eyes roll back and he fell down on the floor and I went up to figure out what was going on. And, and we became friends. And it turns out this guy who's named Keith Price had uh, never been to seminary or college, but he had graduated from the... Uh, uh, Royal Air Force Pilot School and then flew in the Canadian Air Force for a few years and then was trying to figure out what to do with his life when he went to a similar missions conference and heard A.W. Tozier speak and, and went up to him afterwards and said, could you teach me how to preach? And, and uh, <clears throat> Tozier asked him a bunch of questions and said, okay, if you'll uh, drive my car and carry my luggage and do all the work I give you to do for the next two years, you can, you can be my driver. And I'll teach you how to preach if, if uh, God the Holy Spirit wants to make that happen. And he did actually become an amazing preacher, Keith Price, this, this guy that I knew. And, uh, but he, he told me something very interesting once. He was talking about uh, the World's Fair that was held in Toronto and how he'd been asked by a bunch of Christians to set up a Christian center there that would try to influence everyone coming and going from the World's Fair with the gospel. And he said, so I, I, it was the first time when I had the responsibility of hiring a, a bunch of Christian workers um, and it occurred to me that there is something about uh, a set of people as a subset of the body of Christ and that it is that they identify with their death in Christ and their life in Christ in a way that most Christians only embrace as truth but never practice as a way of life. And somehow the Holy Spirit has shown them the truth of the idea, you died. And now your life is no longer yours, but it is in Christ. You know, it repeated 34 times in the first and second chapter of Ephesians. And he said, I, I, I decided that I was only going to accept people who I could get to describe to me in whatever way they had experienced this identification with the life, uh, the death and the life of Christ having actually happened to them in the spirit world. You know, this is something that, go something that goes on in spirit, not physically. 
And, and so he, he did that, and it ended up being a, a, a very productive and fruitful group of people, and, and literally thousands were brought to Christ in, in this uh, World's Fair in Toronto, which happened uh, back in the 60s. Um, but the point is, here, here's a guy um, <clears throat> recognizing that there is within the church uh, a mass of people who believe that the truth is true. But then there's a group of them, a much smaller group, who have actually learned how to get the Holy Spirit to convince their inner person of the reality of that death in Christ, and then having put displaced what was me before that, what, what was you prior to your regeneration, with this union of God's spirit and your spirit. He gave you a new spirit and a new heart, you know, Isaiah. Uh, and so you, you got that new spirit and the new heart, and he put the spirit of life into communion and union with your spirit eternally and uh, set you out to walk through the world as a vessel of the glory of God and uh, meant to be this light to the nations. And you know, that's, that was uh, Keith's description of how he found fruitful Christian workers because people who had been through this transformation accomplished by the Spirit that led them to incorporate, or he used the, the phrase, to identify with the truths of who they are in Christ to such a degree that the Spirit was allowed to, to make those uh, the, the default mode of walking through each day for these people. It became their worldview. I died. And it's a very real thing to them. They, they get up in the morning with the thought that, okay, I died and God came and made a new creation. And that creation has the divine nature of Jesus. It has the holy life of Christ. It has the wisdom and the power of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of power all placed uh, ready to access in here in my part of this uh, manner of revealing himself to the world is a life of worship, a life of koinonia, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 9 is our calling. You know, we often think of our calling as a place or a job description or a certain education or whatever. <clears throat> the Bible never talks about, excuse me, <clears throat> the Bible never talks about a calling as being a place or an education or a job position. Our calling is always, in every place that it's mentioned in Scripture, some attribute of Christ, you know, holiness and obedience and on and on. But I, I think our primary calling is described in 1 Corinthians 1, 9 as fellowship with, koinonia with Christ himself. So there's, there's our calling. There's the activity that is our side of what God is doing. So if he wants to reveal himself, which he does, through us, which he's prepared everything for, um, he is waiting for one thing, this uh, life that worships him that bows humbly in his presence using the humility and the faith and the love for him that he's established in there by showing us who he is. And that's what he's waiting for for each one of us so that he can use us for the only purpose we've been created for, his ability to reveal himself further to others in the world. And so that's um, how the life of God in the soul of man works. And yet uh, somehow 
uh, we, we need to find uh, a way of living with him that submits to this transformation in its fullness day by day by day. I mean, it, it really happens moment by moment. I can be uh, walking in the spirit this moment and all I got to do is look away from God and quit crying out, help me, uh, which is, that's the cry of the heart. That's the only cry that works because we haven't got anything otherwise. And so it's this, this worshipful heart that proclaims to our own self, to the world and to God, the, the holiness, uh, the, the separation, holiness, same word, the separation of God in, into being the only holy, the only wise, the only powerful, the only loving entity in the world. And yet, here he is hoping to show himself out into the world by that union that he has established with us. And so that's the sort of a beginning of the description of what it takes from us to uh, participate with God in, uh, to give him what he's waiting for. And, and it, it, it can be done in specific ways ways in different parts of our life. You know, we have in our, in our work with growing leaders, we, we list six parts, six things that God's trying to grow uh, in us um, as uh, pillars of the foundation of this temple that he's created. He kind of does things the way I do sometimes when I'm building something. You, you do it the wrong way. You build the thing first and, and then go put a foundation under it. it. It's not a great way for building homes, but uh, God's figured out how to make it a great way for building us into temples of his light and life. But we, we say we, we can be very specific and intentional about growing great faith toward God in ourselves by works of his spirit if we focus on how God would grow that faith in us. I'm not going to talk about that today, but I'm going to list these six points. Growing great faith, growing passionate love for God, growing humble worship of God, learning how to walk in the spirit by the power of the spirit, and then this last one, which I've been talking about today, how to live out the life of the biblical new creation. Okay, we, we see that that's who we've become if we are in Christ. And now we have to learn to walk in that identity. We need to somehow have as our world view, our default way of thinking, the realities of all that God has made us to be. And the, the assignment, actually all of the assignments for growing these things start out the same way. Um, <clears throat> go to this section of the Bible, in, in this case it's the New Testament, and find every verse in the New Testament that um, describes what happened. You know, what did God do? He did something. You know, I, I didn't become a Christian by going to a church. I became a Christian by a work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he came and did something. What did he do? And the Bible's packed full of little parts of what that looked like. And they overlap and they fill up a great big beautiful picture of the new creation. And so we, we get people who want to grow to go find every one of those verses like Ephesians chapter 1 and 2, Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8, uh, um, <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 1. You know, there, there are sections of the Bible, the one I was reading this morning, Second Corinthians uh, 2, 3, and 4. And finding what the Holy Spirit describes as this new creation, the, the new me. I've been made into something and making out a list. And there's quite a few verses there, you know, and 
uh, I have died. You know, there's, there's a good one. Or 2 Peter chapter 1, a description of the divine nature uh, being what God has given me. If you, if you have managed to not be reading from the New International Version um, <clears throat> in your life, you will recognize that you've never seen the sinful nature of a Christian described in the Bible because it's not there, by the way. The divine nature is there. That The idea that you had a sinful nature prior to moving to be in Christ by this work of God, um, that's very clear. But um, now what you've got is full access and the power to live out the divine nature. In fact, I'll read this quote from Whitfield on that last page that I think, oh no, I think you, you didn't end up with that because of the way this got printed out. But um, here's, here's a quote from Whitfield and he's describing what, what is a Christian really? And he says, true religion is a union of the soul with God, a real participation of the divine nature, the very image of God drawn upon the soul, or in the apostles' phrase, it is Christ formed within us. Briefly, I know not how the nature of religion can be more fully expressed than by calling it a divine life. True religion is a union of the soul with God, a participation of the divine nature, Christ formed within us. You know, there's George Whitfield about 300 years ago describing what we're talking about here. And so you can go and look at every place that the Holy Spirit has described this new creation. And then the second part of the assignment is to ask God the Holy Spirit to reveal to you which of the things on that list of more than a hundred verses, you know, you can, you can actually end up with a, a couple hundred verses quite easily. And to ask him to show you um, which of these are already the default approach to life that you've established in me. Which things have already been transformed by works of the Spirit inside of me to where I live by the truths of what the verse describes. And, you know, cross off all the ones that are already your default. And, you know, if you go get a hundred pastors in China or a hundred pastors in Brazil and get them to do, that, to do that, they come back and say, well, I actually don't in general live that way. I certainly already believe everything that's stated in those 200 verses. But it's not yet a way of life. How do I make that a way of life? And, and so the last part of it is to um, take uh, the, the life of the Spirit in communion into your time of worship each morning. You know, get up out of bed each morning and let your first thought to be of God. And, and, and beg him to come and use that day to uh, not just transform you, but to reveal himself to you and out into the world. And take the next thing on the list that is not yet something that the Holy Spirit has established in you as your default and, and plead with God by a work of his spirit to make it the way you're going to live that day and each day and, and make that your prayer day by day by day by day by day until whatever is not of Christ has been displaced by a work of the Holy Spirit establishing in you this tendency to walk with Him in that little tiny aspect of what it means to look like Jesus. And He does that. And some of these things take a couple days and it just makes sense and, and you submit to him uh, freely and happily and other things take a year or two 
They, they really do. We, you know, we have things that, that we hold on to and that have become so deeply entrenched into how we think of ourselves and how we've learned to respond to other people and how we, we don't love people and we don't go get the love of God for them and we don't know how to walk in his spirit or to find his power to be at work in our life. And uh, it, it takes literally uh, years sometimes to, to see these things transformed and the, the life of my old man displaced by the life of Christ and the new creation becoming the practical reality of how we live. And the life of God in the soul of man becomes more and more how we walk through each day. And so I, I, I just want to challenge you to, to think about the reality that you have been bought with a price and that you've been bought for a purpose. And the purpose is just quite clear to be part of this revealing of holiness in Christ out into the world in the form of your relations with people. And all the love of God for every person is right there within you and all the wisdom and the I mean it, it, it won't be without suffering all the suffering of Christ is in scripture guaranteed to be there for all who will walk godly in Christ Jesus so uh, there's the challenge for you know a, a, a period of your life to to Go into the presence of God morning by morning and, and present the day to him and walk in the power of his spirit through that day and learn to bring each part of the life of Christ and what he has made you into to be how you live. And uh, uh, you'll change. You know, a year from now, we can go ask your wife, what they think about your spiritual growth. And they'll say, boy, a year ago, uh, I wouldn't have expected you know, this kind of love and gentleness and humility and, and all the attributes of Christ to be coming from my husband. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's his job. And that's what you've been bought for. So let's, let's walk with him and allow him uh, to fulfill that transformation that he so desires. So let's just take a minute. You pray for yourself and make whatever commitment unto God that, that the Spirit would lead you to, to commit to him. Let's pray. Lord, we come and, and humbly bow down and proclaim you to be Lord of our lives, of this world, of this nation. But we ask, Lord, for an outpouring of your spirit, of the abundance of so many of your graces that you promise that we are going to need to fulfill what you have desired to use us for. We thank you for the the opportunity to live in Christ openly and freely that we have in this nation. And we ask that your spirit would, would become our hope moment by moment for living out the, the life in Christ that you have placed within us. We praise you and proclaim you to be our Lord and only hope in all eternity. We thank you for the fellowship of your spirit that we share, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.